Hello, hello. Hello, hello. You are still listening to The Mother Days, even though one of us sounds the way I sound and then the <laughs> other one sounds like a different person on I the podcast. I sound like I have a, a clothespin <laughs> over my nose. <laughs> I don't know. It still is any, Sarah Olsen. <laughs> it's still, hi, everyone. It's Sarah Wright Olsen. <laughs> um, so I don't know if the rest of you have gone through this epic cold uh that's happening this cold season but um I currently have it and my everything is blocked from my lips up okay it's like my nose my eyes my ears <laughs> I can hardly hear She was just hear in it. the infrared sauna <laughs> Yeah I was <laughs> trying you know, to drain like it the, all out That is the only place where I feel like I sit in there and I'm like oh I'm, I have so much gratitude for the fact that right now I can breathe you know like that for some reason, <laughs> and I'm sure that some doctor could DM us and let us know why, but like what, why in the infrared sauna does everything sort of open up and is it the heat? Like, what is it that makes, cause it, that's when my nose feels clear. And then as soon as I get out, I can't breathe anymore. <laughs> and I'm back to this. So you just need to live in there. You need to sleep in there. You need to eat in there. Yeah. Just be in there yes. until it passes. I just, at 145 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god do you know I used to do yoga at this place called moksha yoga in yeah. LA and I was just constantly sick back in the day because that was when I was like minute oh. and I was eating like super clean which now That's I realize right. was not really that healthy <laughs> and I would go to yoga like 17 times a week <laughs> and I oh, was yes. always sick but I would do the yoga and I would feel like it was cleansing me of all the juices, the bodily juices. Yeah. And then I'd get out the same thing and immediately be like, oh, like just feel so sick yes. again. I know. It's crazy. <sighs> I don't know what it is, but it, um, the heat definitely helps. It makes me feel like, oh, maybe, I, maybe this is, I'm getting through this, you know, there's like something about the, this is um, like a 24 hour bug. <laughs> yeah. There's a 24 hour bug. No, it's definitely not. It's, I had to get like a full respiratory panel on my kids. It's not RSV or COVID or flu. It's just some um, kind mm. of cold and it's not fun. So this is what I sound like for so this excited. episode, everybody. <laughs> you boo. Um, well, we are very excited this episode. Um, my inner 17 year old is coming out <laughs> and having a big old party um, oh because God. we have the amazing Melinda Clark, Melinda Mindy Clark on the show today. And she is... If anyone was like me and obsessed over this little teeny tiny TV show called The O.C., it's the one where they're all based in like Newport Beach and it opens up and it's like, <laughs> California, oh, California. So good. Hey, hey. <laughs> this is the best show ever. I was oh, so obsessed. So I would have good. watch parties. You with would? my friends. Um, oh, my god! I would. And I had some friends who were like, Team Marissa, some friends who are Team Summer, some who are into Ryan, some who are into Seth. Anyway, but I was always into Julie Cooper. And Julie oh. Cooper is who Melinda Clark played <laughs> on the OC. And she was this like <laughs> sexy, badass bitch mom. And oh we get gosh. to have her on the show today. Yay! I'm totally geeking out. <laughs> Yay! Oh. Love it. We love a badass bitch. Love it. We love a badass bitch. We love mom. a badass bitch. And, and she was you know, um, she made some interesting decisions as a mother. Um, yeah, and I cannot yes. wait. To, <laughs> cannot wait to talk <laughs> to, to her about into all her character. The things. <laughs> all the things. So, so we did your intro right before you came oh, on, really? and in our intro, I was saying that. I am fangirling out. I yes. am the biggest <laughs> fan of the OC. It was like my teenagehood. Really? I would, I would sit and watch that show 
We would have watch parties. We were like team Summer, team Marissa, team Ryan, team Seth. Like we were obsessed and it's just so wild. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Melinda Mindy Clark. <laughs> She's Julie Cooper. <laughs> well, thank you guys for having me on. I, you know, when I, I heard, I, first of all, I'm fans of both of you. And oh, I was just, yeah. I haven't finished Coven of Witches recently oh. and I was like because for some reason I was like why can't I watch the oh I have to pay for it anyway it's annoying oh yeah it was like yeah, yeah we went to search for it because we've been watching so much tv since the pandemic but um <laughs> but anyway no I was so excited and I was driving yesterday and I'm like oh that's where I know her from yes anyway oh. so <laughs> how old were you when the OC was on I love um, it so I was 17 it, I think it first aired in, <laughs> aired in 2003 yeah. so it was my last year of high school oh. and I was the perfect age for it to come out and I really <laughs> saw myself in all the different characters and I had such a crush on Seth but then it would swing it was like a pendulum I'd be like but actually I'm into Ryan because he's the bad boy and but he's a bad boy but with soul and heart um so it was just he's always, a he's a brooder. I was just a weirdo <laughs> He was a brooder and he, Ben McKenzie, it's so funny. We've got the same manager and I was so uh. star, starstruck when I first met him when I came to LA because we have the oh same my manager and, my, and I had just like, it was this big whirlwind coming to Hollywood and getting signed by these American agents and stuff. And my manager's like, oh, you know, these are the people I represent and there's this guy, his <laughs> name's Ben and he's on the show. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and I remember meeting him for the first time. And just being like a little idiot, like just <laughs> words were all jumbled. And I was like, oh my why am I way more star starstruck around like Ben McKenzie? And my, my manager <laughs> had taken me to these really big parties at Cannes like the year before. I had my first film premiered there, which is hilarious because I've never had a film premiere at Cannes ever again. And I didn't realize, I think, at the age of 19, like the significance of that. But I was like, wee, I was going to all these big parties and seeing these very famous people like Bono and but then when I saw Ben McKenzie, I was like, oh my God, like I could not speak. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to talk about the OC the whole time. And he was just like, yeah, what's up? Right, right. No, oh God. Rachel Bills and I, you know, we've been doing this podcast and, you know, we remember that, that, you know, Adam, I mean, of course there was, there were team Ben, team Adam, but we remember for some reason throughout this podcast, we've just been really super, we love Adam, but for some reason, Rachel's like, what the hell? Why did I not, um, why was I not as interested in Ben <laughs> during the time? But I guess as an adult watching it, she's like, she, she's, yes. she's watching it with a new set of eyes, you know, of as an adult watching it, there's a whole different perspective watching the show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That so, so much sense. I would love to jump into uh, your podcast. I was listening to it. Actually, my kids go to school an hour away from my house. So there's always a trek. And I was listening to it on the way and then on the way back. And I just had this massive grin on my face the entire time. It was, it was so wonderful. I felt so nostalgic, even though I wasn't there. Um, and I was listening to the way that you and Rachel were talking about it and you were reminiscing and Josh Schwartz, the creator, came on and um, I just thought it was so beautiful hearing you talk about how you were a mom. You had mm -hmm. this little girl. I think you were 33 when you started and you had mm -hmm. this little divine child. And I'm sure you didn't realize when you were doing the pilot that this was going to become a global sensation and it would sort of unfold over the next however many years. Um, and you were shooting like crazy, but you're also trying to be a mom. I'd mm -hmm. love to hear about that time in your life and how you navigated all of that. Thank, you know, thank goodness for Rachel, who, who just out of the blue, I think it was like, what are we going to do during this pandemic thing? And, and she uh, sent me an email and I really hadn't seen her in, a, in God, almost a decade or something. Um, but when we had the opportunity to do this podcast, um, it was, it was literally, I just, it, I mean, you know, we have different skills in this industry. You know, we, we, we have to be, we have to know, you have to be proficient in all these different mediums, whether you're on stage, on it's film acting, TV acting, but there's nothing that teaches us how to podcast. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, but that being said, it, it's been an amazing, wonderful learning experience and getting to do that. And then also like meet new people. And so thank you for having me on. Um, it was such a, you know, it's such an idyllic thing now that I look back what a perfect 
job for a new mother. She was three. Mm-hmm. She was born oh. in 2000. So she's the oh year of the gosh. year. So she's about, she's 22 now, oh. graduated college and oh, right. Wow. And, uh, she's, uh, um, just an amazing, she's my best friend. You know, we oh got through gosh. all of the growing pains and now she's my bestie. Um, but at three being, you know, so essentially supporting cast to a show that became so big that we, I mean, that's one of the things we analyze, like why it burned so brightly and it kind of, I don't want to say fizzled out, but it burned so brightly very, very early on. Um, but what a perfect job for a mom to, I lived mm-hmm. in Sherman Oaks, but we lived, uh, we shot at Raleigh Studios in Manhattan Beach, but I didn't work as much as the core four, Ben, Misha, Adam, and, and uh, uh, Rachel. Um, and, you know, to hear their stories, it was way, way, way more, you know, they're doing the 18 hour days and they're Oof. doing it eight, you know, eight, uh, eight days per episode. And they're shooting every, Misha and Ben, I, I feel like did the most. But um, I would work maybe three days a week. And I mean, I I didn't care if it was four in the morning sometimes. I was like, I get to, you know, it's difficult being a mom to a young one. But there were times where I was very aware that that going to work was my respite, you know, and going home to domestic life was like, okay, I got to prepare myself for that. But um, but I had a husband at home and, and had that support. So it was it was it was just such an idyllic time. And uh you know, and then subsequent to that, I think the thing that, you know, was so difficult is well, like first, I don't know, I haven't heard all your birth stories or all of that, but <laughs> but I do know that, you know, we tend I, I you know, I could be a nervous Nelly from time to time in my life. And I know that being a mom kind of nurtured that nervousness from uh, and then at some point, you know, when you're on a show that big, I know that coming off of it, I had put some pretty strong expectations on myself like I need to get on another show that big and and the next thing you know it's like I have I've been offered a show in Toronto and my daughter's Mm. she was seven when it when the show ended and now I've got a show that's in Toronto and I'm like I can't do that you know and I was like wait a second uh no I you kind of you know it's the same company it's the same Warner Brothers and all that Peter Roth and everything it's like I've got to go do this show but then yeah I've got a 10 year old who's saying I don't want to leave my school I love my oh, school my in Studio City, right? Mm-hmm. So we, I decided that it was, for me, it was going to be flying back and forth. But oh, this child would be Sarah running. Sarah knows about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, first of all, can I just say when I, I was, I didn't know that you guys have eight children between you. And I'm like, <laughs> I got one. And my only child is so ecstatic to be an only child, but, and it was difficult enough. So I, I'm just in awe of you both oh, having, doing this. Thank so. you. Well, you, when you describing this reminds me of when Sarah had to do a similar thing. And I think it was to Toronto as well. It was, yeah, it was to Toronto. And by the way, I can't wait to hear the rest of your story because Toronto and LA and managing like your children wanting to live here and your partner being here, like whatever that is, it, that is, that was challenging. Like Toronto and LA is a challenge. That is not something that I recommend for anybody who's like wanting to be there. (laughs) I want to be a mom who's like showing up all the time for everything. Like that's the kind of, you know, person that I I was wanting to be and, and still want to be. And I was not able to do any of that when I was going back and forth to Toronto. Yeah, no, that, I mean, coming onto this podcast, I was thinking like, I got to ask these ladies how they do it with so many, you know, how you're working. And I mean, because everything, it's so rare to actually get a job in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, you know, we're shooting 10 months, nine to 10 months out of the Mm -hmm. year. So, uh, yeah, it was a challenge because, you know, and I also was going through a divorce. So when you actually, Uh, when they, when you talk about uh, those things that are, what is it, um, the, you know, the most stressful situations in life are, um, you know, obviously death, divorce, moving, starting a new job. And there's one other, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but I was going through all of those at the same time. And it was, you know, looking back now, it really taught me that we are such survivors, but it put me into survival mode, not quote learning mode, you know, learning yes. mode is, is, is thriving and we're, and we're in peaceful, like, you know, like today we're in, we're thriving peaceful mode, but Mm -hmm. when you're in survival mode and you're going through that kind of trauma, I couldn't memorize my dialogue. I was having trouble memorizing big, huge, you know, scenes. And so I had to relearn because the first thing you lose in when you're in grief or, 
or yes. having something traumatic is um, your short term memory. And oh. that was really a weird experience for me. Now I got over it, but it also taught me that you can get through anything. Yes. Um, it made me stronger coming out of it. But, um, and I wish, you know, the gift of awareness now is that it's, well, also I'm an empty nester now. So I'm like, this wow. is the time to work. I right? can't wait but, to hear about that. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but I, there were, there were times, you know, negativity just so outweighs positivity in such a very unbalanced ratio. You know, um, as I say, it's like at least five good things to, to outweigh one negative thing. Mm -hmm. And I think uh -huh. in some certain situation, it needs to be triple that because when you see your daughter, literally, you know, the car comes to pick you up to go to the airport oh. and she's screaming, running oh, down the gosh. sidewalk going, it's don't horrible. leave me, mom. Yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and, and in that situation, she was staying with some dear friends and literally on the way to the airport, I cry, I'm crying like 15 uh. minutes later. And I say, how's she doing? And he goes, she's fine. She's over it. We're playing. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> heartily. <laughs> What is it? She just ripped my heart out. So <laughs> it's it always was... the build up, the build up yeah. to the leave that's like yes. <gasps> filled right. with all the yes. emotion. And then once like the uh, separation actually happens, everyone's like, oh, okay, we're good. We got this. Yes. Like, yes. It's, so, yeah. it's so interesting. Oh, you're such a rock star. That is I unbelievable. I don't know if it's that Rachel, you know, Rachel and I talked about that too. She had a show that was in Vancouver, which at least you're in the same time, um, so, uh, time and zone. And it's closer. And yeah. it's closer. Yeah. Going through Pearson airport. And if you didn't have fast yes. pass or whatever it is, um, or global entry, or it was always, it was always a challenge, but I guesstimated. So here's the thing. When you go to Toronto, it relocation is always stressful. And I was reflecting yeah. on this that I've done you know, a number of series that were relocation. And I've never, I've never, it felt unnatural, you know, to, to yes. have to do that when you yeah. have dependents at home, I guess I yes. would say it feels, and it would always evoke some kind of stress in me. And now yeah. I, it's really important, I think as human beings, and this is just me giving my experience lessons that I've been learning, especially recently, is that we have to decide what kind of people we're going to be in life, like how we're going to react yeah. in the, to the world when it happens. Because yeah. I had somehow trained myself to be constantly almost in fight or flight during that. Yeah. And then it mm -hmm. stuck with me. So you're like working out because bad things are going to happen and I'm ready for it. And then that becomes your narrative as opposed to it's cool. We're going to be fine. We're safe. Yeah. I mean, at some yeah. point my brain was telling me that, that, that the world wasn't safe and I'm almost in a foxhole every day and the yeah. truth, and it wasn't, mm. but my brain was telling me that. And, and so it was, and it was hard to, you know, when you know that your family, you know, at least your, your family is, or a, a young child is saying, mommy, why can't you just work at Whole Foods? Oh. And I'm like, do you like your private oh. school? Sorry. No. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I say that to the kids too. I'm like, Poet asked me just uh, now, my three-year-old asked me just now, she was like in a double pram and my cousin's in town. So I was like, do you mind taking the girls out to the park? Because I'm doing this podcast and I was telling my cousin about you. And she was like, Julie Cooper. <laughs> I was like, I know. Um, so, but she was like, but mom, like you look after us. And I was like, I know, but I also <laughs> have a job. And she was like, why do adults have to work? And I was like, well, yeah. you know how much you really love living in this house and you've got your own bedroom <laughs> yeah. and, you know, you've got a little playground and the theatre room. I was like, so that we can live in this house, mummy actually has to work and that. And then you yeah. get this thing called money. And then, <laughs> and then right. she was like, what? <laughs> like her little three-year-old brain's like trying to compute. I'm like, anyway, enjoy the playground. But yes, it's like those moments <laughs> where you're like, it's hard. You've got to make money, yeah. but you also want to show up and be present and be an amazing mom to your I children. Know. It's just this and By the way, when like, you are ugh. going and working and you're, you're also an amazing parent that's providing and doing 
like all these things. So there's mm-hmm. there's that balance too. Is that I think that was something that I was sort of trying to come to terms with when I was shooting in Toronto. Is I was like, yes, I really wanted to do this job. I loved this job. I was like, okay this is important for me to go do this. And then I would take off and I'd be gone for like anywhere between, you know, 36 hours to like four days. And then I'd fly back for two days and I'd go back again and then back and back and back and forth and back and forth. And at some point, you know, I'm like, gosh, I just, I was really feeling the guilt weigh on me and just, you know, feeling bad. Oh, I'm missing this performance or I'm not there for this thing. And um, I was feeling really bad about it. But then I was also, my husband was so, amazing during this time. I mean, he's always so uplifting and supportive, but he was like telling our kids, you know, look what mommy's doing. Like, this is what she loves. And how cool is that, that she's going and doing this and she can watch it on the video and, you know, your performance and she can, you know, do this and do that. And she'll be here for this thing. And he was like, so great at even listening to him tell them that story or that narrative was like helping me. Because I was like, uh-huh. that's right. Yes, I am going and doing something that I'm passionate about. And um, but it was for my experience of going back and forth. It was like once that was done, I was like, OK, that was a really great learning experience. I see something that I don't want to do, which is that I don't want to be traveling every single week. Um, and I do see that this is something that I would love to do closer to home even if it's Vancouver because Vancouver is at least closer it was like for that it took so long to get back and forth and then there were so many snowstorms we were shooting in the middle of winter (sighs) so um but yeah I so appreciate the way that you talk about your reflection afterwards and you know just sort of how that struggle is there and you're trying to figure out you know you had this bar set for you where you were like okay now I have to go do this next thing and you're in this industry that sort of demands that we just continue to work even when you're a mom it's like you don't get to take that time off or you know when you do everybody's like oh well it's been too long you know now we gotta like slip you back in here and let Mm. people know who you are again Mm -hmm. you're like what are you talking about (laughs) oh no it happens I feel like it happens each day Although they're yeah. like, oh, they, they know who you are. I'm like, and? <laughs> but but yeah. I think what you, you touched on something that's interesting is that it's really important to model uh, for our kids. Like if, if I could go back, there are things that I would not let this brain of mine take over because the brain's really powerful mm-hmm. and a negativity is addicting. And yeah. in a way that it's like, if that's the straight, you know, that, and also the what ifs, what if this is going to happen? What if, as, as moms, it's like, what if she runs into the middle of the street? What if she, you know, yes. my daughter lives in Chicago. What if she's walking down? What if it's the most worrying is the most Ugh. useless emotion. Yes. And it only, and your body doesn't know the difference. So yeah. I wish I could have gone back and shown her a lot more positivity with the first, the first, she came with me in the beginning because it was summer break and I took her to Toronto and put her in. She was like, I don't want to be here on the plane. It was like a whole thing. And she couldn't wait to go home. But then it was like, <laughs> but then my mom just recently told me of, over Thanksgiving, she said, we started chatting about it. And she said, I remember when CG was such a brave little girl and you were in Toronto, but she came here for and she lives in Dana Point to come go to a little summer camp. And she just said, she calls her Gma. Gma, I miss my mommy. And oh. she said, my mom started crying just two days ago. And she was like, it was such oh. a sad thing. And I was like, don't make me cry because oh, no. that is like, <laughs> how do you, you know, and, and then, but the truth is you're right. The perfectionist in me was like, yeah. you know, I put so much perfectionism and and which is such a silly silly um way to go about life because we know we can't control everything right yeah, yeah. and um but but also like the flying back and forth your circadian because if you're on a tv show like the one i was doing it was an action show nikita and they would you know, of course we start at 5 30 in the morning on monday and then we're starting at 6 p.m you know by friday to do oh, these yes. night shoots and your circadian yes. rhythms are off so, so I was up, flying. Yeah. The, the good thing was I thought I was going and you never know when you're going to get time off, but I was able to come back almost every three weeks. So oh, and for oh, four great. seasons. Wow. But, Whoa. Four seasons. But Holy it was moly. 60, you know, I don't know how many flights it was, 60 flights or something back and forth. Lots and of I frequent would, flyer points. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I became like... my other superpower is a Canadian air travel agent for myself. You know, it's like I knew <laughs> yes. how to work this, like how to get the last minute things. And sometimes just an economy ticket would be $2,000. 
Oh, yeah. And sometimes it'd be a hundred bucks or something, that's, you know. That's the wor- that was the worst part is when I signed on for the job, I was like, okay, great. I have all these miles with American. American does a, a direct flight. This is going to be so awesome. Like, I could totally make this happen at the last minute. And then as soon as I signed on to the job, about one month later, American canceled their direct flight to Toronto. Yes, exactly. And I was like, wait, what? And now I was like, Air Canada starting all over again with miles oh and the my whole God. thing. And I was just like, I had no, it's amazing how much you like really lean on your perks when you're trying <laughs> to book like economy. To, I was trying to, cause I didn't take the relocation fee and like relocate. I took it to buy flights. So basically I just yeah. stayed in hotels when I was there and then mm-hmm. I would come back and like, I used that money and I was like budgeting it out. Okay. If I, if I use the relocation money, only stay in hotels and buy flights, I'll be great. This is how much the flight are no air canada very expensive sometimes my economy ticket was like fifteen hundred dollars yeah, like, easily what? so you were Last paying minute. to do the show basically well, I, basically so <laughs> i don't think if, i don't know if your listeners know this or we always try to point these things out for television yeah if you go on a film it's location and they put you up for the three four months but if you're doing a television show it's called relocation yeah. just like any other corporate job they'll give you a small fee or yeah. maybe some, if you're lucky, you get more, but they, you relocate and you're, it's up to you to get yourself to set CW will do, will do that. Not all shows will do that, mm-hmm. but also to get your own place. So that's the other thing I did between in those four years, because I also had a home that I was sell, um, staging and selling. And yeah. at one point I didn't even have a house in LA because I, and so I stayed at the sportsman's lodge. I mean, so I moved like fifth because between the big moves and little moves and all the different places I lived in Toronto, I moved like 15 times. Oh, oh my gosh. My so, gosh. Because How even did if you, you feel <laughs> anchored anywhere, you probably oh. just didn't feel anchored. <laughs> well, it, it, took, it took a while. You know, at some point it was like, yeah, the, I wasn't at my best all the time, but it was, I don't know. You, you just survive. You know, it does make you stronger. And And by the time I came back from it, I was like, I don't, unless it's, you know, I don't want to leave LA to, and, let, and yeah. it was, it's so hard now. So now my, it took me a while to, to I actually said the words, I don't want to work, which is dangerous yeah. in this industry yeah. for us. Yeah, right? yeah. that's dangerous words to say. Yeah, for sure. Mate, Sarah I and that. I talk about this all the time. <laughs> we do. We talk about it all we're like, the no, time. We're, we're putting out into the world exactly what we want. The, we want the show in LA yes. and right. um, film that's we, close we want by. all the things. <laughs> we always use the word like yeah. momentum because I don't know if yes. you remember that. Yeah. Word in our industry uh, gets thrown around so much. So by much. Our agents, it's so, obno- managers, it's so obnoxious. It's like, I have well, no right momentum. Now, you have momentum, <laughs> like, or you don't uh, have momentum right now. Yeah. Or I'm like, need I have more great momentum. momentum. <laughs> I just burst a baby, and uh, yeah. I feel like my momentum is at its peak. I'm working out and <laughs> I'm doing all the things. Um, Teresa basically like packs up her entire circus of like all her things, and she travels with all the whole family family with everybody oh, yeah. so it's like do you her all we of her do. children we just tra- yeah. so we i'm can't. curious yeah what are your yes. what are your rules that are in place with your family well basically the kids mainly come with me wherever i go mm-hmm. And my husband, it's a little bit of a different situation than what, say, Sarah has. Like, her husband is anchored to L.A. because he's been on a long-time show for many, many years. 14 years. 14 years in L.A. They have their home. Their kids started going to school in L.A. I am Australian, as you can tell by my accent. Um, And my husband's American. So we were always, like, we're anchoring in two countries. We're in Australia and we're in America. And so our kids have just, we just found the perfect solution school-wise for them, which is a school here in LA, which can be online. When you travel out, it's like basically an industry school. So lots Mm -hmm. of families go there who are in the industry and then the school lets you pro rata. So you only pay for when they're there. And then when they're not there, they go online. Then they have an amazing school in Australia as well. So they, amazing. they just travel with us. We were in Wales for three years shooting a Discovery of Witches. Right. Um, they had a school in Wales. And it is amazing to see that my kids don't know any different. I think it would be way harder for them if they started somewhere, they were rooted somewhere, and then we pulled them out. But because they only know this global schooling and like, what's our Melbourne school? What's our Wales school? They've got friends in all these different places around the world that they still keep in contact with. 
And it's really, really works for us. I think we've said until Bodhi, my oldest, I've also got a stepson who's 14, who is anchored in LA and he just goes to a regular school and we just sort of see him whenever we're in town. And then during the summers, he comes with us. But when, once Bodhi hits 12, we'll have to pick. <laughs> we're going to have to pick. It's going to be either Australia or it's going to be here. And then that's sort of our plan in the future. And it does, it really works for us. That's and it funny. wouldn't work for a lot of people. But I don't think I'd be able to do my job if I, we weren't all together. If we, right. I just, it's just it makes a personal, perfect sense. yeah, it's just this. And even I just booked a job in Australia and I had 24 hours from when I found out that I got the job to making the decision to get on a plane to fly to Australia to start that Monday. She'd only been home, by the way. We, so she was she flew back here. She'd only been home for two days here in L.A., not even like acclimated back from jet lag and then booked this job and had to go back to <laughs> Australia. Your, boy, your boys were like, then they're out, like, we're um, not coming. <laughs> My For the first time, they were like, nope, go. It was 10 days. And I was like, but I can't be without, like, we need to be together. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and the boys were like, no, they had just Peace started out. their new school. <laughs> they were like, go have fun down there. Take the girls. Like, we'll see you when you get back, mom. I was like, what? You were like, what? Well, that's that's key. I mean, if if my if my daughter had, I mean, that guilty feeling because it was, you know, still very young at 10. She was 10, 11, 12, 13 throughout this time. So if she had said, mom, go, have fun. It's fine. I'm good. But it was definitely like, don't leave don't me. Go. Yes. Although oh. she has said to me recently, she said, I am so grateful that you didn't force me to come with you to Toronto. Oh, she said, that's I'm so nice. good. She knows. She's like, I, I need, it was like the one thing that she wanted in that constant because, you know, her father and I were divorcing. She's like, yeah. the one thing I want is that school. I want to key stay oh, at that school. Amazing. So oh. I was like, okay, there. And then I actually moved her from that to, to you know, she went from Oakwood to Notre Dame. And then um, I always say, she's old enough. I can say these things. Yeah. <laughs> but yes. she was, but, and she was not happy about that, but I, but she ended up doing very, very well. So, you know, some oh. kids want that. They want that everyday maintaining, but if you establish yes. something that's like super fun and exciting for them. Yeah, yeah, they don't know yeah. any diff. They don't know yeah. any different, yeah. and it's so amazing to see them slip into these environments and make friends. And the teachers always reflect that to us, like, "Wow, we couldn't believe they came in and just like it's as if they've always been here." And I was like, "Well, that's because that's just their norm. Their yeah. normal yeah. is doing that and making friends on the fly, and like." You know, and I have to keep up with making sure reading, like reading's the most important thing I think in our families when we travel. I'm like, all right, we're reading books. We're just making sure that the reading is up and it's basically the same level wherever we are. As long as mm -hmm. they're keeping up with that, it works out pretty well. I am really interested to ask you about empty nesting and you've gone through all this all the seasons of parenting you've done teenagehood yeah. you've done you've moved into that transition where it's like are they going to stay at home or when are they going to move out and then college and how does that feel what is that like now <laughs> well I you know <laughs> the high school years are challenging for everybody but but I, I want to say my daughter we did something well I mean First of all, I wish LA had actually better public schools, but the truth is, you know, um, after a certain, after Proposition 13, which helps your property taxes and all that, but they, LA and Southern California used to have amazing schools, but she did end up at a really wonderful school and she had a great education and she became a great student and she just mm. graduated college in, at DePaul University in Chicago, magnum cum laude. Uh, wow. and, and I was like, how did you become such a good student? Like kids, it's one thing to be smart, but to know what to do to get these good grades. And she maintained amazing grades, which is um, very helpful. Although now she's not wondering, she's not sure if she wants to do psychology, but that being said, um, it was really the school, like getting her to college was, you know, when you have these college prep schools, they're very helpful in getting them to yeah. the schools. Like I didn't, I, it was all hands off. She, she applied to the schools she wanted. She got out there. And um, the day we came back, my husband and I, I'm remarried, but we were like, I said, I don't want to live in Sherman Oaks anymore. I, I was, I mean, something else personal is that I, I, I was in such a stressful place for such a long time that yes. my, I had a couple of doctors saying your, your adrenals are shot. And oh. I, I know there's some controversy if that's true or not, but 
Um, my cortisol levels were up here and, you know, my yes. adrenals were shot, you know, loud noises. It was almost kind of a PTSD kind of type thing, but they were like, you need to just chill for a couple of years, like relax. Mm. And, um, but we decided to move out of LA because I said, I, I was going through hot flashes. I was getting like an yeah. early menopause type thing. And, wow. uh, I didn't want to spend the money on the air conditioning bills anymore. So we moved to the beach, we moved to Ventura and, um, and we could do that. And, then, you know, shortly after that, you know, my father passed away, which was a difficult time. But then my, the, then the pandemic happened, like right when oh, you're, yeah. when I was starting to feel like, I need to you slow know, down. <laughs> yeah. My dad was, you know, had been sick and he passed away. And then all of a sudden it was like, now it's time to go. And the pandemic happened, which was kind of an interesting thing because now my daughter, who's a junior year from, uh, she missed her junior. I mean, you guys are parents, you had kids doing online mm. school, right? Yeah. She yeah. had to spend her entire, she was, supposed to, she was supposed to go to over, overseas to Italy for the semester. And she had to do it in her little basement apartment um, oh, room. Geez. And she's still oh. pretty resentful of the pandemic oh, doing I her bet. junior year in front of a computer. I'm sure mm. there's going to be some ramifications in the future, like what, Oh, yeah. studying all these kids and what yeah. happened. I'm just waiting for the documentary to come out in five years. Right. I, know, <laughs> I know, I know, I yeah. know. I just, I, I kind of was hoping it would just make them all hate screens like a little bit more, you know, <laughs> yeah. just because like- I hate my iPad. Like, <laughs> my son was so sick of Zoom school. He was like, I just cannot stare at a screen. I can't. He would cry like multiple days and be like, uh, I cannot look at a screen. Right. And, or retaining like, things or even in, in college with my daughter, she, she I think what- I mean, in any situation, as sucky as any situation is, it's it's important to extrapolate what the lesson is. Like you, like you uh -huh. said, Sarah, like you know that my daughter said she loves the she loves getting up, walking down the street to go to to be in class. I mean, and she's talking about grad school, and she said, "I don't want to do an online grad school. Grad school, yeah. I want to be on a campus." Mm -hmm. And and that human connection. And she said, "I can't retain Spanish online." I'm sorry, yeah, I just can't do it. Annoying. I get that. Yeah. So, but that being said, I mean, the emptiness, thank goodness for FaceTime. We FaceTime all day long, every day, <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> because there, you know, pandemic was one of those things that right when it was like, okay, let's get back to work. And as awful and terrible as it was, for some reason, to me, it just, it turned off all the chaos when the whole yeah. world and the and all of yeah. humanity is in the same situation and there is no audition to get to or or next job to get to. Yes. Mm -hmm. All you could do is sit with yourself and take some time to reflect and take care of Mindy. Where, yeah. you know, and really like dig into some therapy and some things that were like, why did I, you know, why did life make me so stressed out when when ultimately so it was a really healing time to, to this, you know, and one of the things that, you know, my mom used to say, when I was a kid, I used to say, I'm bored, mom. And she'd say, that's a bad word. You know, that was what she taught me. It was a bad word. And what's interesting is I feel like when you're go, go, go all the time for so long and yes. your neuro pathways are always to operate at this high level, we need to create new ones. And mm -hmm. that's what this kind of downtime did for me. And it's then, like reframing where you know in like relearning um what how i react to the world and how we react to things instead of being nervous about it, it was always about that that future tripping which is anxiety you know yes. that future tripping anxiety. or something like and they what say if? depression is past R ruminating yeah yeah exactly so you're so and it's like well wait a second i had a friend who said to me he said i don't i don't i don't feel like that because i'm excited about the unknown and i thought that's a wonderful way to think about it like yeah because i was never living moment to moment when you when you do all these things on your you know i rest in peace irene cara 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 she heard that song out here on my own you guys yeah. are too you know that song from fame right yeah. <laughs> um I, she just passed away and I just was listening to that song and I was like, oh, that was kind of that time for me where I was yeah. out on my own and mm -hmm. it felt so, un it felt so different. And then, but now I just feel like, you know, there's a point in your life where you, um, I feel it's, it's not boredom. What people might consider boredom, I consider peaceful. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> because, because there was so much like, you know, when you're on location too, if you're sitting there and you have 
it's like, what do you do on the weekends? If you don't have laundry to do independence, you know, it's like, there's a yeah. lot of like, let's go out to, to what is it? King and Queen street and in, in mm-hmm. Toronto. And, and, <laughs> and it's like, that's just not me, you know? So, yeah. There's a lot of like mental stimulation that goes on. And I think like for mothers in general, like we're balancing and juggling so much and so often we neglect our own self-care and I had sort of an epiphany like as you were speaking I was like oh wow that's really interesting hearing that from your perspective and you've been in the innings even longer longer (laughs) than what we have and I got to a point this was about two months ago I was in Adelaide South Australia and I had been saying yes to a lot of things and I would said yes to these events and it was like one thing after the next but I was also doing school drop-off and also my house had termites and I was staying in a hotel and there was just (laughs) so much going on and I'm packing and unpacking and getting ready to fly out to Bali and I was just like running on adrenaline and it was so much and I you know that feeling of like I hate being late and I'm like I felt like I was constantly late for things and yes, then I was yes. so rushed and like I hadn't done my hair and makeup probably for this event and I my shoes I had blisters on my feet I didn't it was just I got to the, the end of the day and I said to my husband like it's too much I am doing too much I'm saying yeah. yes to too many things I feel yes. scatterbrained I'm gonna stop like saying yay about me being this multitasking mama and I'm going to focus on not multitasking. How can I actually just slow down and choose one thing and be present in that one thing rather than being all over the place with all these things and then celebrating myself for like everything I've (laughs) achieved. I'm like, Mm -hmm. no, I'm done. I, I said to Mark, I'm too old. That was my excuse. I was like, I'm too old. I can't do it anymore. I don't I don't want to. I don't have the bandwidth. I want simple. I want simple and easier. And I feel like I've scaled my life back somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> but I've made a conscious effort to be doing less. And when you said the boredom is peaceful, me staying at my house this past week and like unpacking a box and listening to a podcast and like just being in my closet, putting away some clothes and doing some little labels in my daughter's room, like prairie undies and prairie Mm -hmm. t-shirts. Like nothing (laughs) has brought me more joy. I'm like, I feel so at peace. (laughs) And it's amazing. I I do feel like we honor the, like we, you know, there's this thing where we hold this like super high pedestal to people who are like always multitasking, getting all these things done and, you know, everything. And over the past year, I feel like I've been trying to drive this home with myself, but also just out loud with my friends and family and everybody, which is that we should really honor the like time that we take to be present in each of the tasks instead of like trying to multitask a million things. Mm -hmm. I am so bad at multitasking and yet I do always I always want to like yeah I'm, I'm like I have a creative brain right so I'm always wanting to go after and do this and do that and do that and then but I have to tell myself sometimes and keep myself in check and be like okay you obviously like everything feels a little chaotic you're doing too many things like we need to honor the time that is a little bit slower honoring the slowdown being present and just kind of doing the one task at a time kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, instead of being like, oh, that person's so awesome. They could do all these things. And, you know, I just don't I don't think that's always the glorified that, that should be the thing that should be so glorified. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I appreciate what you're saying and how um, that peaceful time is uh it's so nice and it's so important. And it's also just in reflection to like some of the seasons of our life when we're, you know, taking so much on and feeling so spent. It's like when you don't show up as your full self anyway, you know? And so like, it's hard to show up as a, a parent who's, you know, your, your brain is like half somewhere else. It's like, I'm here in front of you and I'm trying to play dolls with you. But then my brain is like, I have 15 emails to write back and I have this and I have that. And I have to go to this thing and I have to wrap this up because I really need to go make dinner right now. (laughs) And it's um, when I get to that place where I'm, where I'm doing that and I'm sitting in front of my kid, I go like, no, I don't want, why am I doing all of this? (laughs) What is the point? (laughs) You know, life, look, life can kick your ass. I mean, yeah. and it, and it all, and it will, but like, I, it's something that, and, and I, we, I think I gotten to a point where it's like, I need to control everything because I'm, because I'm prepared for that thing to happen. 
And, you know, because, you know, people have accidents, people pass away, people, you know, there's, I was very conscious of when my like anxiety was happening. I had a sister who passed away when she was 20. Um, six years old and oh, you know and and it was shortly after that and then I became a mom shortly after that and you know when that stuff oh, kicks in yes and, but these are things you have to go through to say wait a second why am I literally living fear-based I was conscious of that I remember being on yeah. the set of the OC and talking to Kelly Rowan one day and we were having this con- conversation and I I remembered this and I can't believe I said it with such like I said I live fear-based because bad shit happens and I'm ready for it and that And she was like, that's no way to live. But that was my like, but I thought that was like strong and courageous, which is it's impossible to live in the moment and live in the future. Or you can't be grateful for anything if you're constantly negative or thinking about what you don't have. You can't do both. And I can't multitask that, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. so it's really it. So those are like lessons that I've learned that because things are going to happen how am I going to react when it does? And yeah. because I went through a period of time where I was such, it felt dramatic or also I, you know, when other people's emotions affected me too much, I don't, it's okay to let somebody, I need to normalize, or I've learned to normalize people's feelings, normalize being flawed. You know, nobody's perfect. We need to yeah. normalize messy and instead of, you know, when loved ones around me were having a hard time, I took it personally Or um, I was like, well, how can you be like that? We need to fix this. You know, those Mm -hmm, kinds of attitudes. And it's not, it's okay to, to live in that grief or pain or whatever you're going through in that moment. But it's important to recover quickly because I was one of those people that would live in it. Something that happened, I would live in it it. for weeks and not let go. So it's, it's like, I feel it. And now I'm, it's, I'm much more proficient at, understanding that number one things are temporary number two my feet are on the ground I've never felt better at 53 you know um but it's all come from really reflecting understanding going back to the childhood like why you know this stuff all starts in childhood yeah is it the zero to 17 childhood trauma (laughs) when you have this information okay so I figured out some stuff that happened and you know maybe my dad was a little bit dramatic when I was a kid but what am I going to do with that info now? Yeah. It's yeah, going to, yeah. it's like, you're going to let, you're going to move forward with love, not fear. Yeah. A hundred percent. And yeah. it's I that mean, conditioning. My husband talks about, you know, the childhood conditioning and how yeah. you, when you take a personal inventory and you find like, oh, this is my user manual. And in fact, wife of mine, this is my user manual. And if you need any tips on how to nurture me or hold me when I'm feeling flared because of my childhood conditioning, like here are some suggestions. And I'm like, I have to remind myself, I have the user manual. He needs affection. He needs affection right now. I will show him affection because that is a physical like demonstration of how I love you. I'm with you. I'm not leaving. And And, so and I know that that's what you need. Exactly. And you communicated yeah. that. I mean, my husband and I are at the point, it's like, I say, I have to say, because I'm, I'm my, my nickname is Mindy Mouth and I would be impulsive and just say whatever streaming thing is coming out of my mouth. Instead, <laughs> I, I learned when not to speak, but also may I, do I have your permission to talk about something right now? And it could mm-hmm. be like, no, I don't want to discuss that. It's really important to preface that with your loved one. And, you know, I tend to think like sometimes if I was having a hard time, it's like, I just want to be alone. And then my partner actually might need a hug. And, and sometimes if I yes. don't read that and he gets upset that I don't read it, you know, so it is that communication, you know, is, I don't know. I I just, we've learned so much and come through some difficult times that it's just, it's really the pra- gratitude is a practice, you know, mm-hmm. it's a constant practice every day yes. that I wish now I, I understand that any of these situations that I'm talking about are difficult. If I had some of those practices or tools, as they say to, yes. to, to say your, your brain is just making this shit up. It's not, yeah. it's near, you are safe. Like my brain had me, had the sky falling and living in a, in, in the gutter. Like, you know, if I don't get this I, job, you know. Hearing you talk about that is so uh, cool because I, you know, we had 
um, Stephanie Keith on, we were, had this uh, manifestation episode where we talked about, you know, manifesting. And I've been reading her book after, you know, doing that episode with her. And um, I find it so fascinating because so much of what she talks about in the book is living in this place of positivity, of gratitude, of like, you know, you're sort of re like framing your brain on mm-hmm. some of these things where it's not like, oh, I, I, you know, I'm hoping this will happen or like this never happens for me or like whatever it is. It's like this. Sometimes we can default to this like negative place and not even realize that that's the cycle that we're in in life. And then but if you can change that and you can look for what's the positive spin here or like what am I grateful for that's mm-hmm. in my life or what's happening in my life? And um, I just I feel like she she hits it home so much in, in her book when she's talking about it and listening to you, um, you know, I, I can tell by some of the language that you're using that you have um, done a lot of, of work on, you know, gratitude and positivity. And you're also just talking about like health in general. I was reading about how um, like sauna and ice bath is so good for those, uh, you know, when you're talking about like being in that fight or flight and your, you know, your, your rhythm being off, like not being able to sleep, like all of these things. My husband does a sauna and ice bath every single morning. He's like in the ice bath at 5 30 AM or something. Um, but I really do think it's like, crazy the way that those things you know when you're putting your health first and you're really focusing on like okay this gratitude positivity I'm going to take care of myself like so much opens up and releases in your body and so much of it is um so much of the way that you feel or the outlook that you have in life like it changes and it's crazy because your brain is being told stories from your like your subconscious is like learning and and sort of reacting and you're telling yourself these stories. So if you're mm-hmm. telling yourself these positive stories, then it's like your body really starts to believe it. Well, and do, don't you think, okay, as actors, that yes. we could, if I wanted to <laughs> right now, I could choose to create a world in my mind that uh-huh. is Armageddon. And if I wanted yeah. to, I could c- choose to create Eden, you know, like look li- literally, but you can't do both at the same time. Yeah. Right? right. So it's like, you know, I could sit here and say, damn it, what happened to that audition? I really wanted that role and I'm never <laughs> going to get a job. And, 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 oh, this person, this person, or, you know, or I could literally say, that was a win. You weren't supposed to get that job. You're the, the the one that you're supposed to get. But what's what is happening right now is exactly what is supposed to be happening. Yeah. And so you could, and then my old my old brain would say, that's a lie. That's a lie. <laughs> you know, or, oh, you know, yeah. it's a really interesting thing <laughs> because we listen to our internal monologues that and mm-hmm. allow them. You know, there, the other thing that I've learned is that, you know, there really are no problems, just solutions. And then somebody else said mm. there really aren't solutions, just trade-offs. You know, these <laughs> ideas, <That's cool. laughs> these ideas, but the thing is sometimes if we think about, you know, I have problems and it's like, do you have problems? Because what I've learned and through a lot of therapy is that if there's an issue <laughs> is like, I just need to look at, you know, if someone comes to me and says, you know, this upset me or something that, that I instantly want to defend, I actually mm. need to take a pause and say, is there any truth to that? You know, like if, if, and say, I need to look at it because almost any problem that, that we have in our world, if I look at myself first, instead of an outward, out, the outward part of the problem, really look at like, what's, what did I do in, what is my part in this, you know, or what yes, is my responsibility yeah. in this? And there's something really powerful and understanding that, oh my gosh, I was wrong. Mm. And if I'm wrong, it's, I don't always want to be right. People like to be right. If you're always right, you're never learning. If I'm exactly. wrong, I'm learning. Exactly. If I say, oh my, yeah. I thank you for correcting me because now I just learned something. And yeah. if we are humble, egoless, not self-centered human beings, then we're going to thrive more. So I, I call it the power in the pause. So because <laughs> my my tendency, my husband will say something and I'll be like, Wah! like I'll jump back on it. And I'm like, no. I'm having the pause. I'm having the reflect. 
And then we've been using this particular thing and we went to this amazing couples therapy who gave us this language. We went to the, him about three years ago and he's known, his name's Dr. Stan Tatkin and he's known in, in our industry a lot of, we're actually going to interview him on the podcast. I remember you talk. I remember you He's amazing. He's the one that yeah. kept, like gave us like use a manual. Yes. He, yes. And he says, he's like famed for knowing like you as a couple can go to him once and then you can do a tune up in a few years time. Anyway, he does these amazing sessions. So we went to him and he kept reframing the way I was. He wants you to argue in front of him. He wants to see an argument and like the flow of your argument. And then I, we've got this beautiful thing that we say now, which is the story I'm making up about this is. Yeah. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. I find that that's true for anything like with friendships with like insecurities like I like I booked this job and I'm actually like way more of a dramatic actress and it's a comedy and so like my narrative was I'm not worthy I'm not worthy these people are huge movie stars they're funny they're like comedians like I'm I'm unworthy so then my my thing that I was saying to my friends is the story I'm making up about this is that yes. like I'm not talented when it comes to comedy and I'm feeling really insecure about this. And I, so, but we do it in our um, interactions with each other, like husband and wife, he'll say something and he's like, the story I'm making up about this is that you don't love me as much as I love you. Or I'm like, <laughs> the story I'm making up about this is like, I you only Mark. care about yourself or whatever, whatever <laughs> it is. But well, it's so beautiful because we uh, own our I narrative. Love that language. Yeah. I'm so glad that you gave that link because I love the user manual language yes. that you have from that. And I always think about that now that like, you know, even when we did our episode with Eric, when we were talking about relationships that's and husband. like the, that's my husband, we were talking about relationships and he, um, you know, ha- there's like things that he really has from my user manual now that really helps us when we come mm-hmm. to conflict and communication. And, um, but that was from Teresa's therapy session. I got somehow <laughs> for free (laughs) I got a little piece of that therapy session (laughs) oh my gosh I think so so much of everything that I was talking about really is like this affliction of self-centeredness because you don't Mm. think of it you're like oh no you know it's it's no actually you're really your ego and self-centered and anytime you do something defensive or angry or frustrated it's your it's your ego so dropping that and literally trying to be there for the other, you know, if I con- if my if each partner consciously is there for the other one and try to take yourself out of it, it re- that conflict resolution is quick, right? It is. Yeah. 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 So oh, true. I love oh. it. I met your husband Eric. I just I was thinking about that when I I was like, wait. Okay, so because I need to make sure cuz I I like to be prepared. But <laughs> we were on a um, we were on a fox jet together once. Oh my god. And so it was one of these things. Missy Halperin was the vice president of marketing. Oh, I love if you remember Missy, Missy so much. I just ran into her the other day. Did you? We wanted yes. to get her on the podcast for because she was so such a big part of the marketing of the show and, oh, and everything. She was so, the best. Yeah. Now she's the head of casting at Discovery Warner. And, yeah. She's but, amazing. But there was one of these things. I got a phone call for, and I want to say it was probably when... The OC was going on, I want to say it was 2006. So wasn't he doing a sitcom with Brett Harris? Yes, that's that's the sitcom that him and I met on. So oh, okay, oh my God. that went together. Yeah, what which was is it crazy. Called? The lo- uh, no. the loop, the loop, the loop. Okay, yeah. So we get a call, and it was I want to say, and I can remember everybody, but basically she she just gathered up some Fox actors and put us on the plane where we yep. literally flew to Detroit yes, to have a I dinner this. with Ford. <laughs> The Ford people and like Terry Bradshaw and Joe Buck were there. And, yes. And um, it was Eric and Jennifer Morris. And yeah, Jennifer Morris said, yeah. Mary Jean Rizchuk. Do you remember? And that actress. And also, um, oh gosh, I'm, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not remembering the other actor. But anyway, and Peter Liguori, the president. Anyway, yes. so we flew to Detroit and played poker on a plane and flew back. <laughs> oh and, my but gosh, it was literally that's... like... On the scene, we flew on the day, and then we were back that night. Anyway, oh so my god! Tell him I said hi. I don't know if he remembers I know, that. I will. Oh, he definitely will. I actually remember when you guys went and did that because yeah. I was like such a weird. That's not a, a weird, normal thing, no. everybody. Like that's not. They don't just like put you on a jet and take you somewhere. Like if you get a, I think one time when I was.
was doing the show Quintuplets, they put, and I thought, because it was my very first show, so I thought this was a thing, that they were like, <laughs> oh, we're going to pop you on the Fox jet and send you to the Billboard Music Awards, just you and, like, one other cast member. And I was yeah. like, oh, wow, fancy. I've made it, you know? <laughs> that never happened ever again. That's not a thing. So. Oh, my gosh. But well, that Mi- happened to Eric. <laughs> Missy had a famous story that she was actually, and I don't know if the OC kids were on it. It was, I, I feel like, so the, the jet, they were going to the Billboard Awards and they had um, Misha, Ben, Adam, and Rachel, and then Paris Hilton was on the plane. Oh my gosh. Gosh. And, yes. and, and, and Missy was a little late. And I guess some somebody, or I think she told this story that, I guess it's okay for me to say it, but I guess Paris was like, let's, <laughs> the, they're, they're, let's go. And the plane took off. No. And Missy was like, get my effing plane back here. <laughs> they had no. to come back around and land. <gasps> and she was like, oh. uh, no. The, the kids are like, we don't know what's going on. So some, somehow that's... they took off and it was like, that's a big no no. You don't oh do something like that. No, no. That's <laughs> hilarious. hilarious. Yes. Oh, oh, my God. Anyway. Well, thank you so much oh, for coming you. on and doing the show. It is like, I can't even believe we're already at an hour. Like, what? This is crazy. I, I could sit here think- and talk to you all day. I no, same. There's just so many wonderful things, and this is my my gratitude list right now today. That I got to meet you guys as a highlight of my Aww. day, and Aww, just so that sweet. podcasting is like one of the things that I learned from it. It's like I would never have gotten together with these people. We went through this thing 20 years ago collectively, mm-hmm. and I got to catch up with people and chat about it. I'm not picking up the phone and having these hour long conversations about stuff. So I just think podcasting is a really wonderful thing and thank you for yes. having me on yeah oh, it's amazing we enjoy it so much we and love it. um i was listening i love rachel so so much and yes. met her through eric um he's friends with her and uh and she's like hearing you guys and your chemistry and your banter and everything on oh, the show so is like good. so good it's <laughs> so great so if anybody um that's the OC bitches, right? Is that yeah, how you say it? Welcome OC to the bitches. OC bitches. Welcome to the OC bitches. Okay. Because well, the, the famous right. line was welcome to the OC bitch, but welcome to the OC bitches. Bitches. I love it. I oh, love yes. it. So yes. great. So check out so Welcome fun. to the OC bitches. I mean, I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast already checks out Welcome to the OC bitches. But um, <laughs> if you're fans like we are, then uh, check it out because it's so awesome. Well, if you guys and are fans, you want to come on and break down an episode I with us. I would yes. love to. I Are would you kidding love me? to. I we do. Already, we, I've already okay. been thinking about what I would say, what I would talk about. I know. Like what? Same. Well, oh we're God. going into season four. So Ooh. and we have a we have a studio in Van Nuys and it looks like the pool Amazing. house in the background and all that. Ah. So if you could come in person, we could see. Oh meet my you. God. I know. I was, I was reading like, okay, they're in the pool house today, and I was like, ooh, we're in the <laughs> oh, pool house. It I looks feel like, like the I pool have house. so many fun things to talk about. <laughs> oh, okay, we could. We're doing. Okay. We're doing it. So right, and, where can, and where can people find you on Instagram? Yes. Oh, I am the Melinda Clark. Somebody oh, else nice. had my name, so the Melinda oh, Clark. The yes. Melinda, yeah. Clark. Melinda Clark. Yeah, I love right. it. Beautiful. Take Thank care. You so Lovely to see you guys.